You're listening to a content production of Higher Things. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents Why Bodies Matter with hosts Erica Sorensen and Pastor Harrison Goodman. curved in on yourself means sin, that it means isolation, creates anxiety. Well, welcome everyone to Why Bodies Matter, a podcast produced by Higher Things for youth and their adults too. The title of today's episode is Bodies Matter and Identity. I'm your co-host, Erica Sorensen, along with Pastor Harrison Goodman. Pastor Goodman, would you introduce our guest? I am ecstatic to uh, introduce our guest. Uh, This is the esteemed Reverend Dr. Todd Peppercorn. He is uh, one of the founding members of Higher Things, which is my favorite thing. So he's automatically one of my heroes. Um, He has uh, served as well as editor of its magazine for five years. Uh, To everybody else, uh, you would know him today as... uh, well, a member of the Concordia Theological Seminary staff since 2021. He serves as Assistant Professor of Pastoral Ministry and Missions and as Director of Vicarage and Internships. He is also the author of I Trust When Dark, My Road, A Lutheran View on Depression, and lots and lots of other stuff, too. So, uh, Dr. Peppercorn, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it is my pleasure. Anything I can do for higher things and for you guys, you need but ask. So, happy to be here. That's awesome. The first question is, I want to know if um, your title, your seminary title fits on a business card. How do they do that? That's, that's um, what I want to know. It does. Yeah, it does. But it's but it's one, it's a really small font. It's like a six point okay. font. So I would and have to put my glasses if on. If you can't read it, if you yeah. can't read it, then you can't come to the seminary. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's the first now test. Now that I say that, that seems <laughs> awkward because I don't, I'm not sure I can read it. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh-huh. all good. This is at a small school like Concordia. Everybody has lots of titles because everybody's doing all kinds of stuff, which is just yeah. fine. That is good. That's a good thing. All mm-hmm. right. Well, let's, let's talk about what we want to talk to you about today. Um, Cause we could talk to you all day about many things. Um, we want to sure. talk to you today about identity. And when um, Lutherans talk about identity, that kind of is, means something. So I, I wanted to start with, if you can kind of talk about how do Lutherans talk about identity? How is it maybe different from how the world would, would describe identity? I think, I think there are a couple places where, where Lutherans and really where the scriptures can start. We could start with God and move to us, or we can start with us and see, and see how that connects us to God. Um, Let's start with God and, and kind of move forward from there. When God created man and woman, he created us in his image. Let us let us make man in our image according to according to our likeness, Genesis 1.28. And so God, in creating his man and woman, Adam and Eve, actually did so giving them bodies. So there is a, a physicality. There is a reality there. That's what mm-hmm. truth means, is that it is it is real. It is there. And so there's no, there's no image of God apart from flesh and blood in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. With the fall, of course, that image of God is marred and mushed almost beyond all recognition. Mm-hmm. But in Christ, that image of God is restored. So the word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And so we have in the flesh and blood of Jesus... Now that is where we see God, and and this is kind of the f- cool part. I think that is where we see ourselves, because mm-hmm. when we're baptized, God puts His name upon us. He restores that that image 
and brings us into this holy conversation that goes on uh, for all eternity between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are now, uh, we're now participants in that conversation through baptism. And I just think that that's a, such a fabulous picture, but I really like the kind of the physicality of it, that, that this isn't an idea. It's not a philosophy. It's not a concept. This, so this isn't like Buddhism or Hinduism or some other, uh, so many other world religions really come down to how do you think about stuff? Mm-hmm. And, and this is very, very concretely a story, a narrative of God becoming man so that we might become like him as he intended. That's, that's that's really different cool. too because I mean yeah. you, you think about it um it's not even just sort of the, the eastern religions but even just sort of western society that if if you're going to have any concept of spirituality or the divine first you have to understand yourself and and it's really sort of a quest of self discovery uh but more importantly I recognize it through cartoons uh because they never <laughs> sort of depict God um as the person of the sun uh you might sort of get Jesus in a bathrobe once in a while but almost every time they talk about God it's like an old gray beard and a sort of like a faceless monstrous being uh that that we would recognize as God but there's no real actual identity to him um, other than he has a beard. Uh, for some reason, that's that's always there. Yeah, that's a sign of the divine is to have a beard. I, that, mm-hmm. I have problems with that. For I a thought, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you both have beards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have problems yeah. with that for a lot of reasons. Uh-huh. So, yeah. We're just glad you don't have a beard, Erica. So. I, you know what? I am too. I am very thankful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, God, for creating me without a beard. Um but I think what you said is is really interesting because you very distinctly pointed out that um, the that God has made Himself known um, to us without us having to kind of search and find and um, and 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 look for Him um, inside ourselves to somehow kind of go. Do I, you know, where is God? I got to find him. I got to look for him. I have to do the discovery. I have to be the person. Who, but he, no, he actually reveals himself to us and not in just, in a very, in concrete ways. Um, and that, that is profoundly different. And contrasting that, I think, to, um, to, to how youth right now are being told to figure out who they are. I think there's a there's a vast ocean between that and what's going on. Can you comment a little bit on that? You have Gen Z yeah. kids too, like I do. So so you, I really you know, do. you have a lot of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we have four kids from uh, fifteen to twenty two. So yep. that's kind of uh, that's our world pocket. as uh, father and mother. Yep, mm-hmm. and in so many ways, they are asked and expected to look into themselves for the answers for the who they are answers for the why am I here to what am I supposed to do with my life Um, everything from jobs to how you're feeling and and all of it all of it is is kind of inside and you know in in Lutheran theological terms we call that being curved in on yourself and that curved in on yourself um means sin but really in this instance i would argue that it means isolation it means that you are now distinct and apart from the other that everyone else is other and so my job my job my kind of my life isn't to find find my commonality to identify my family my friends my neighbor my whatever whomever but rather it is to figure out how i am not like them Mm -hmm. and in figuring out how i'm not like them i'm supposed to figure out how i how i am like myself i don't know and and so it becomes very it becomes very circular and essentially creates anxiety that's that's what that that ends up with is if you've got no place to go, no one to speak to, and the very, the very people that that are your lifeblood are somehow distanced from you, and 
that means family, but that also means friends. That means, Mm -hmm. um, that means all these, I mean, you figure that the seniors in high school this year are kind of the, the COVID class, basically. They're the ones that were freshmen, uh, the year that COVID hit. And so they're the ones that have kind of experienced this, uh, separation and distance and all of the joy, which is distance learning and, and all of those things has now become what it means to be a high school student for them. Yeah. And so that's just like an enormous magnifying glass or maybe a force multiplier to cell phones and social media as if yeah. that needed more multiplication. Right. And it makes it so that we are, so that we're just... Uh, separated from each other and from and from God, which is the absolute worst thing that could happen. Well, tease that out a little bit. Um, what does the human psyche, what does the human spirit need um, in place of that? Well, I, it, going back to the scriptures themselves, it is not good that man should be alone. Yeah. And if you were if you were to look in in, in psychology. And, and I'm not a psychologist, nor the son of a psychologist, but, uh, but I will, I'll, nevertheless, we can kind of dip our toes in this a little bit. If you were to understand something that, that uh, high, school, high school students um, really like personality, they like to have personality, they like to be, they like to be different, they like to show mm-hmm. their personality, you can, you can see, especially in freshmen, it's like they try on different personalities, like they're yes. trying on different outfits until they kind of <laughs> find one that they're comfortable with. Well, it's impossible to try on those different personalities. If you're by yourself. Yeah. There's no such thing as a yeah. personality by yourself, you have yeah. to be interacting, interacting. with other people. Yeah. Sure. And and so by by not having that interaction, or by having kind of the uh, the TikTok snack, Snapchatization sort of interaction, where you're literally filtering reality, yeah, what that is what that is teaching at a very visceral level is that the real me is not good enough for reality. The real me is not either not worthy or doesn't belong. I think doesn't belong probably fits even better. And because the real me doesn't belong, I have to isolate myself and then present myself in this kind of, um, in this alternate world, because that's the only world in which I feel like I can belong. It's and gonna leave. Boy, you want to talk about anxiety inducing? Yes, <laughs> yes, God. yes. Well, and and it. if yes. personality is always sort of defined in in opposition to somebody, and based on mm-hmm. interacting with the people in the room, that also means that your identity is always changing. Like, never can you wake up a day and say, "I am the same as I was yesterday." Uh, and if you never actually know who, not only who you're supposed to be, but who you actually are and, and who you're going to be, if there is no sort of constant dealing with a constant like the alpha and the omega is going to seem um, like kind of a drag, I imagine. But oh. um, like even just sort of how you're supposed to relate as a Christian, let alone um, a, a, as, as somebody who just needs to get by in this society, it, 30 seconds at a time is about all I got the energy for. Well, yeah. and I think, and I think yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was going to say it also lends it t- itself to a very unhealthy loop because mm-hmm. you are trying to present a persona, for lack of a better term. Um, you're kind of trying it out. It's very fake. It's disembodied. And then I'm doing that as a, as a high schooler in search of community, essentially, in search of friends, in search of um, social connection. But I'm going to be less and less likely to want to present myself in reality um, I'm going to want to continue to be online. I'm going to continue want to text. I'm going to continue to want to sort of doom scroll because, um, because that's where I can kind of project this into into the world um, instead of the the sort of fake incom- incomplete one that I feel that I have. Um, and gosh, that makes all kinds of sense to me. Uh, we've got oh. we've got kids post COVID co- talking about increased anxiety and depression and. Um, you know, it just, it's just, a, yeah. I feel like it's a loop they can't get out of. Yeah. And, yeah. and the word, if I were to, if I, if I had to put, put this kind of 
I, if I were to try and identify what this looks like or who, you know, how does this, how to describe this is fragmented. Yeah. Is that our, our lives are fragmented into these individual slices or pieces of kind of different, different parts. And, and to some extent, that's always been the case. I mean, mm-hmm. and I, it, you think of, you think of, I do at some level act differently with my family than I do with my peers, than I do with my students, than I do with my grandparents or whomever it might be. There is some sense of, okay, I, I do tailor myself to different people and that's okay. That's, that's really more a sign of the breadth of character than, Mm -hmm. than anything else. But you can tell when someone is, is insincere and is kind of faking it. Mm -hmm. But what this has done, what this fragmentation has done is made it so that it's all faking. (laughs) There's nothing else. There's no foundation. And that's where that baptismal language becomes so, so important is to say, I am baptized. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And that, that, that makes me who I am. That's not based on a feeling. That's not based on a filter. That's not based on a conversation or a number of likes or the size of whatever social group it may be, either real or virtual. That's based on who Jesus is and that God became man. And that's, well, I, I think it's pretty liberating. Yeah, and it, frees us from that anxiety of constantly having to try to try to reimagine myself for a world that can't settle down. Well, because it lets you look back at something concrete as opposed to forward into something in, in, intangible, ineffable, um, hard to get your head around. Um, do you think that has something to do then with with um, especially sort of the the I don't want to call it a gender crisis, but um, that the the gender questions that we wrestle with today? Um, society really sort of yeah. seems to start with this this quest of of trying to figure out the unfigure outable, and then from there find a gender as opposed to looking back into something time and space. Um, like it, it's not just well, sort of there are yeah. two genders drums, but but there, there's there's sort of an insecurity. There's there's an insecurity in my. I'll, I'll say there's an insecurity in my physicality, just in my in my having a body. And I'm just mm-hmm. going to go out on a limb and say that that is that is a part of being a young adult is mm-hmm. being is being uncertain of kind of how all of these parts work and fit together. And especially if I'm growing, it's it's messy and complicated and, and, and the hormones and, the hormones and, and, never yeah, forget those yeah, <laughs> let us never forget the hormones <laughs> yes and i'm so still trying add, to forget those hormones and then you add things like um like dopamine and you yeah. know this kind of rush that you can that you can get from social media um and it and it creates this this sense where okay i need to I need to distinguish myself. I need to find myself. And um, and if everything that is me is intangible, if everything that is me is, and I'll, I'll use this word in quotations, spiritual, that is not physical. And that's kind of how we describe spiritual. Mm-hmm. Some, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's spiritual equals not real. Um, and so if everything mm-hmm. is spiritual, a part of what that means is that um, I can be my own video game and I yeah. can yeah. choose my own character and I can and I can adorn that character with whatever whatever physical attributes I want based on what the group is that I'm trying to identify with at a given mm-hmm. time. I, I think that, that that flows out and that's not that's not a, a criticism of, of role-playing games. It's, right. it's simply a, an outgrowth of this is the, this is the mentality that you, that you have. And that can, and, and I think that that can go back to um, anything from Pokemon to Dungeons and Dragons to, you know, kind of what I would call old school 
role playing mm-hmm. things where you were mm-hmm. taking on a character. Only now, the character is quote unquote real. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and that's and that's where you're you're gonna find uh, huge gender confusion, and that's where our medical community is incredibly incredibly conflicted about this because in many ways politically they want to be you know gender affirming multi-gender affirming so you can be whatever you want but they also get more and more and more evidence that says that this creates anxiety and depression that it actually makes everything (laughs) worse and they and they're they're having a harder and harder time trying to keep a lid on that yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think you, you've alluded to this, that that time of life, um, when you are growing and changing and becoming more independent, um, is a very vulnerable time. I think, I mean, I can speak for females, your body sort of almost becomes an enemy in some ways. Um, it feels that way. Um, and it's scary. And so, I think when we at the same time have the ability to um, escape to that level um, and kind of flip the world and we think, well, gosh, you know, I can, I can subdue my body to be what I want it to be. I'm in charge of my body. Um, That's kind of a, that's kind of a scary thing, particularly for youth whose executive function hasn't fully developed yet. You know, that, that consequential thinking um, you know, we talked before we started rec- recording about, you know, when, when the, the three of us, we'll just call us boomers. Cause that's what they call us, even though we're Gen X and <laughs> millennials, but, yes. um, thank you. But you're welcome, buddy. Uh, but we talked about, gosh, when we were in high school, we had all this angst, but our angst about figuring out who we were had to do with, well, what am I going to be when I'm, gr- when I grow up a little bit, some of it obviously had to do with, mm-hmm you know, how am I going to be attractive to the opposite sex? How am I, you know, how am I going to form these relationships? Who am I going to be? That has really, um, it's not just that anymore. I feel like it's, 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 uh, you know, tons of other stuff loaded on top of it, which is just the fundamentally at the cellular level, what am I? Um, right. Which is profoundly disorienting. And if you don't have a, a, a root of, creation in the image of God, if that isn't there, then if I could use this expression, then all hell is going to break loose sure. because there is nothing holding things together. Um, and that, and that sense of, of fragmentation becomes uh, a sense of desperation that I, that I am desperate to, to try to grasp onto something and and it's always going to be the next thing because that's also how I am conditioned uh, on social media. Yeah. I I do really, I do want to emphasize though, that, uh, that this is not a doom and gloom thing. Yes. That this is, that the reality is, is that you are created in the image of God and that Christ has redeemed you by his blood and that and that by God's grace you are baptized and that that identity is secure it's there it is it is rock solid and it's not going away and so helping helping people whether they're you know 20 or 120 or whatever recognize who they truly are is really a tremendous amount of fun because you can almost yes see the relief on someone's face yeah. when they recognize I don't have to make all this stuff up. Yeah. I can just be who yeah. I am. Yeah. 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 And it, it kind of even the Christian- freedom to fail. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of turns Christianity into a, a blessing instead of just another curse. If you're starting with the idea that there is this such a thing as a, a God out there and you need to behave your way into his good graces, it's just one more demand on your identity that you're so already struggling to define. But if you start with the thing that it's so easy to assume that there already is an identity, there is a, a God made man, he already did die for you, you already are baptized, your identity is already done. Well, well then Christianity stops being a burden to do one more thing, but it, it's it's a starting place of, of all the places that you you have failed. 
to, to be enough in, yeah. in any way that anybody would measure, there's something already saying you are enough. Yeah. And that's, I, I think it's not only beautiful, but it is profoundly hopeful mm. because that's, that's the one thing that the, the fragmentation of our world can't give. There's no end to that. There's always more division, more fragmentation, but in Christ, there is hope. There is a future. There is this, this reality that I can rest in that wondrous gift that even when my body is just a mess as it is sometimes mm -hmm. uh, i am still in christ and what could be better and and so is everybody in the body of christ we have mm -hmm. we have that uh wonderful communion uh, with our Lord in Jesus and with one another at the same time. So we have instant yeah. community, which is, um, I think it's, it's a real gift. It's a, it's a profound gift, um, to be able to have that. So, uh, Dr. Peppercorn, um, if, if, uh, what would you say to somebody out there that's, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, transgender or, or any of the things that we managed to list today, but what would you say to, um, a kid out there who's just struggling to figure out who they are? Where, where could they start? What do they need to know? Where would they, where would they start? Um, I would probably start with, uh, with trying to listen more than more than trying to speak i mean you could you can point to the scriptures and i do think that the creation account is a great place to uh to spend time reflecting on but very often being able to simply be a part of that be a part of their life yeah give them give them a meal give yeah. them uh give them something tangible that's going to say i'm I'm not just here to tell you what to do, but I'm here for you. And that means whether things are good or bad. Uh, until that relationship is sort of established, honestly, you're just saying, sort of saying stuff probably isn't going to matter a whole lot. Yeah, so they need something that's real. Would, that's where I would yeah. start. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they need yeah. something real. Yeah, yeah. And how do Pretty how fun. do Christians get fed in their identity? Like, what does that, well, what does that body of Christ business mean? How do we continue to, to deal with this, our own identity crisis? I, there, are, there are a couple of, there are a couple of great images that you find in the scriptures. Um, one, of course, is from, from John, you know, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, this mm -hmm. image of Christ as the, as the vine that feeds us where we bear fruit um, means that I am connected to Christ, that I am a, I am from the same root, if you will. Uh, and I've always loved that, that image. Plus that also has this great kind of picture of the Lord's supper um, there as well as, as I receive his body and blood and he feeds me, um, I in turn both receive life and then am able to serve my neighbor. And that kind of brings me to the other picture that uh, we were talking about a little bit before. Uh, Martin Luther has this wonderful sermon. Uh, the title of it is something like an all become one cake. And in this, mm -hmm. uh, in this sermon, he talks about how, uh, how flour is made, that flour is made up of a bunch of kernels of grain that are then ground up and crushed into this flour. So you can't really say this flour is from this grain or that grain or that grain. Mm -hmm. It's all one, it's all there. And then that is, uh, then from that comes, bread comes cake i like the image of cake better than bread although i like, yeah, we'll bread go. I like cake yeah, um, those are good yeah i like cake um mm -hmm. and from there in the same way we are uh if you will ground up by the law by the consequences of sin and uh and are helpless before god and god takes that takes us and builds us into this beautiful this beautiful cake, <laughs> this, this wonderful gift that then we can go out and, if you will, be food to the world mm -hmm. that we can actually give of ourselves knowing that in, in Christ there, there is no, 
end. It's, but rather in giving of ourselves, I am receiving more of Christ. And, and I love that picture because that gets mm -hmm. at identity, that gets at belonging, mm -hmm. that gets at, at who we are, that gets at where am I most at home, mm -hmm. if you will. And I am most at home in Christ. And, and so that kind of also grounds my life in the altar, which is a great, uh, a great picture. But I love that idea that we are, um, that we are food for one another. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's very hopeful, frankly. Oh, it is. And I think it's exactly, uh, what the world needs. I mean, we know that's what the world's need, what the world needs. Well, I can't think of it. Another question to an uh, answer that would have him answer that would top that one. So I think yeah. we will, I think we'll cut it off here. Uh, Reverend Dr. Todd Peppercorn, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss our faith in the flesh for this disembodied age. It has been a joy talking to you. And also I am now hungry for cake. <laughs> well, the, let it be so. It's I mean, win-win, right? Win-win. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much All for right. being with us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you.